This is everyone. I think this is everyone. Congratulations on being here for the best panel of your lives. It is. It's, it's, it's going to be life changing. <laughs> so, I'm Zach, and this is Andy, and we're from Mega Cat Studios. And welcome to the panel on new retro game, games, staying physical in a digital world. So first off, we should introduce ourselves a little bit more, go into what we do. I am Mega Cat Studios Retro Apostle. I bless people with the goodness and the gospel of retro games. Um, I'm Andrew Marsh. I'm the uh, lead designer for Mega Cat Studios. I am the guy who knows way too much about how old video game consoles work 30 years after the fact. <laughs> so, it may seem weird with all these AAA titles out there, you know, all these, you know, 1080p and all the graphical things we can do and all the powerful things we can do with all these systems, you know, it begs the question of like, why do retro games? If you're unfamiliar with Mega Cat, that's actually what we do is we make brand new games for old systems. We make new NES, Sega Genesis, Mega Drive, Super Nintendo games, hard copy cartridges that can work on, you know, period hardware. So it kind of makes you wonder like, well, why even bother besides, you know, the novelty of like, oh, new NES game in, in, in um, 2018, why? So I think retro games still have a lot to offer. I have some points up here. Yeah, um, totally. Um, for one, um, the, the pixel art style is, is sort of part of the mythology of retro games, of, of video games in general. There's a lot of indie titles out now that, that mimic it, you know, that emulate that style because um, it holds such a special place in everyone's hearts that you see pixel art, you immediately think video games. Same thing with the sound design, you know, chiptunes and 8-bit uh, music has is, is become a genre on its own, right? There's people that make, you know, original music using just the sound chips of the Game Boy, for example. And then I think from, from exactly, yeah. yeah. From a uh, from a gameplay standpoint, there's something about the mechanics of a retro game. You know, they didn't have room for all these bells and whistles of, um, you know, just kind of like piling content on you and um, um, internet and multiplayer and all that. It, it, the core experience had to be fun and engaging, and retro games nail that. Yeah, and I w I would be willing to argue that even today, games with simpler, more streamlined, focused mechanics tend to be more fun than ones that are kind of all over the board. Um, you know, if, if someone has like a more focused experience, they can just sit down and play the game and have fun with it. And they don't have to sit there and have like this huge learning curve. I think a great example of a new indie game that kind of mimics all of those or emulates all of those is Celeste by Matt Makes Games, the guy who made Towerfall. If you haven't played it, you should. It's a very fun platform. It's very challenging. It has that kind of like NES hard, retro hard, um, slant to it, but it also has, you know, a mode to help you kind of overcome that. It kind of lets you, like, cheat a little bit. But, this, but it ha has all these points, you know. It has the kind of, like, soothing chiptune music. It has definitely mimics the retro art style. And then the gameplay, it's just there's pretty much two core mechanics. You can jump, then you can dash. And every level just introduces new puzzles and hazards and things to kind of iterate on that. So, sure. It does have cutscenes, yeah. but they use, you know, just the, um, the in-game sprites. There's no, like, FMVs and, you know, there's no um, voice actors and things like that. At its core, it's a very, you know, retro-styled experience. I think, like, Super Meat Boy 2 or, like, VVVVVV are, like, good examples of, like, games that really have... VVVVVV takes a little bit further. It's supposed to look like a Commodore 64 game, but um, both games have, like, really simple core mechanics that just sort of keep you coming back no matter how hard they get. So in this talk, we're going to go over the process of making a retro game. Um, we're going to go over the design and development. We're going to go over testing it. We're going to go over the manufacturing process, which is you know um, salient for Mag Labs. This is a makerspace type of convention. And then we're going to talk about um, um, enjoying it and playing it with fans. So let's get started. So whenever you're designing a game, whether it's a retro game for the NES, whether it's an indie retro game, you know, that's coming out on Steam, or whether it's a, you know, AAA game, I think there's generally the same kinds of questions you want to ask yourself, and then some are unique to the, to the console as well. So I think first and foremost, what I do is I, I ask, you know, what type of experience do I want to offer? What do I want the players to feel? You know, what do I want them to, to get from the, uh, from it? What emotions do I want to evoke? And that'll kind of, you know, inform every aspect of it. What type of game, what genre, what kind of characters you have, the music, the art style, all of that. So when we're making retro games, we always think, you know, what hasn't been done on the console before? You know, what kind of new things can we take? What kind of modern gaming trends? And we can we, you know, slap on an NES card, you know, in ways that make sense. Um, 
we also look at sort of our library and see, you know, what's kind of missing, you know, what hasn't been done, what, what, what haven't we done yet that, you know, we can challenge ourselves with. Um, there's also a question of how can you make the most out of the console you're using because they all have different specifications, limitations. Even the same, like, 16-bit consoles, the Sega Genesis and the Super Nintendo are very different in terms yeah, of really what they can display. and completely different machines altogether, you know. So there's something to be said with designing a game that uses them to the max. And then there's also the question of, is there anything we can actually gain from the limitations of a classic console? So to kind of answer these questions, we'll use Little Medusa as an example. So the experience we wanted to create was sort of the classic NES action puzzler game. So with a charming, relatable protagonist. A lot of the NES era games were very family friendly with these cartoony type heroes and we just wanted to kind of capture that and create our own. So we have Little Medusa herself is Artemisa. She's the daughter of Zeus and she's kind of like this favored child of the gods which makes her a little bit haughty, a little bit arrogant. And then the villain of the story transforms her into a Medusa, hence Little Medusa, and she has to fight her way through Olympus and all the realms of the gods to kind of take it back. And in the process, she learns more about herself and learns about, you know, being less caught up in her own fame and kind of beauty. And um, at the end, she becomes a powerful and just ruler. Yeah, say so by the end, she learns, like, compassion and humility and stuff. Exactly. So we thought, like, okay, so what hasn't been done on these, um, on the system? You know, what hasn't been done in the NES before that we kind of take? Achievements was a, was a no-brainer. You know, that's, that's not even exactly a new mechanic anymore, but it... It definitely hasn't been done on the, um, the NES, so we added those in. And then we're also thinking of a more modern trend is um, speedrunning. You know, Twitch and Mixer have, have become the, their own beasts, essentially, where people just watch other people play games, and, and a lot of the content is stuff that's speedrunnable. So we thought about Little Medusa, and like, how can we make this in a way that would encourage people to speedrun it? If you haven't played it, it, it is pretty tough, um, and you tend to die a lot. <laughs> we made a mode called Olympian mode, which gives you a set amount of lives and no continue, so it's, it's kind of an endurance. It's like, how far can I go? How fast can I go? So, and once you're done, that's it. It takes you back to the title screen. So we figured that would be a way to encourage people to play it that way. Like, if you have a lot of skill with it, you're familiar with the game, and you're just, you know, testing yourself and maybe, you know, against the other people out there in the community. I'd say on, on top of that, too, um, just the base game, um, each level has, like, a par score that you have to beat. And as you go through the game, eventually you have to start getting through the puzzles a lot faster to be able to beat that score. And, have it, and you have to do that in order to like unlock like a later world. So it really like pushes like a speed run mechanic in it. We'll get into this later, but we also use um, some powerful components. There's different board types that you can do different things with, and we use a, a fairly powerful one that's readily available. And then to get back to you know the core of it is um, Little Medusa has couple mechanics you, you know you can move you can petrify enemies and you can place a boulder and that's it and then we just use that to you know pack out 50 levels plus a hidden world of 10 more levels um, just by iterating on that adding new tricks and uh, hazards and traps and just different ways to use those core mechanics in interesting fun engaging ways so it has that retro experience you know we went take one thing and then just iterate on it and deep dive on that rather than having a whole bunch of shallow fluff bells and whistles Ooh, this is, this is me. <laughs> uh, um, so, yeah, when, when we're making a game like Little Medusa, um, we have to start thinking about how we're going to work within the restrictions of the console. What, what is that going to do for us? What's it going to do against us? Um, so a lot of stuff that we have to look at is, like, the graphical restrictions of the NES. <clears throat> All retro consoles store their, tile, or store their raw graphics da data in, like, 8 by 8 pixel tiles, like real small tiles, and they just sort of arrange them however fits best. Um, and then with the NES, you don't get very many pages of those, so you have to think about how to use them in the best way possible. Um, also, on the NES, there's some palette restrictions you have to deal with. Like, um, you can have each palette is only four colors, and one of the colors has to be like an alpha color, like it's a transparent and it's shared across all of them. And so you can have four palettes for sprites, four palettes for backgrounds, and that's it, like at a, at a time. Um, with sprites, there's tons of rendering limits on the NES. Um, you can only have, sprites are made out of the same 8x8 tiles, um, and you can only have 64 of those tiles on screen at once. You can also only have eight of those tiles displayed on a scan line at once, like on an old CRT television, like the scan lines running through it. 
Um, you can only have eight of those before they stop rendering the sprites. So you have to use things like sprite flickering and start planning that out sort of ahead of time, like where you're going to need to use sprite flicker to get the effect that you need, where you don't want to have it. And that's like all stuff that has to be pre-planned before you really start making the game. Um, with the backgrounds, uh, there's a system called attribute tables in the NES, um, where everything's stored in eight by eight tiles, but for the backgrounds, you can only select palettes in 16 by 16 chunks. Like the screen's laid out in a 16 by 16 grid, and that's how you have to pick, like that's the space you have to pick the palettes in. So you need to start thinking about like, what palettes are you selecting for your backgrounds? How are you gonna blend them together? Like, are you gonna like have like maybe two of the palettes share colors so you can have like overlap tiles in there so it doesn't look like everything's laid out on a grid? So with all of that, it kind of begs the question again, why do this? There's so many restrictions, it's, it's so limiting. You know, why bother? Um, another thing um, I just thought of is the NES palette itself, it only has 256 or 64. How many colors? I think 64. I, I don't remember. It's not a lot. It's not a lot of colors. Yeah. And, and, and good luck having anything red. Right. Yeah. There's not a lot of warm tones um, in it. So that's mostly like why Mega Man's blue. You know? Yeah, so I was going to say, that's a fun story I like bringing up anytime I'm talking about the NES palette. Um, Mega Man was originally supposed to be red. And they decided when they started making them that that was going to be impossible because there's like three decent red colors, but there's about nine decent blue colors. So they decided to make them blue instead. <laughs> so, so again, it's like, why do this? Um, I, I actually would argue that there's things you can learn from making uh, games on the NES that can kind of make you a better artist in oh, yeah. other arenas. So to mention, like we talked a lot about the sprites and the colors and whatnot so far. So yeah. if we, we take a pixel artist that's used to you know, drawing games for you know, a PC release and throw them on the, at the NES, they kind of, flounder for a while they're like whoa there's like so much here and a lot of them just can't do it but in a way it's it's a lesson in uh, kind of again getting back to the core of, of what you want to show what you want to you know exhibit there's there's characters in the NES that are you know symbolic to this day not just because of the nostalgia but because they're so kind of elemental um, so working within these limitations forces you to be creative in new ways so if we can only fit you know so many pages of graphics on an NES game, then we can use a trick such as having all the enemies use the same legs, for example, so that way when we load them up, they can all just use that same set of legs and then differentiate them yeah. by having different torsos and attacks. And I guess swap out heads. Um, this is, I actually have this set up over here. This is a page of raw graphics data from Little Medusa. Everything's saved monochrome. The palettes are selected after the fact. That's all done on the program side of things. Um, we use the MMC3 mapper, which is um, the most readily available mapper for if you're using like aftermarket parts like we do. Um, so that means we have about 64 of these pages available to us to make a game. And then on the NES itself, when you're playing the game, it can only load one background and one sprite page at a time. So that's a pretty interesting limitation to always have to keep in mind um, is just the very small amount of graphic space you have. And then if you want to look at the programming side of things, you have 512 kilobytes of program data. It's not very much. <laughs> so that also makes you a better problem solver. Yes, because definitely. Because you approach this and you know, you're told that, okay, this character can only be you know, 16 by 16 pixels. It needs to have this many animations, but it, they can only be this many frames, and we need you to fit it in this much space. And you're forced with all these, and you're up against the wall, so it really does make you like, okay, how can I... How can I flip tiles? How can I mirror tiles? How can I reuse parts to make this all work? So it, it definitely makes, it's like packing a car when you go on a vacation, you know, like, oh, you know, I put this here, like, or Tetris, you know, yeah. how, how, what's the most, you know, organized way I can come at this and, and try to fit it in? So it definitely forces you to, you know, be a problem solver and come up with some creative solutions. It, it's kind of fun in a way to think like, you know, aim high, this is what we want. This would be like the ideal game that we want to try to make and then like, okay, how can we mold that into a way that's going to fit into the, the NES? You know, it's kind of the uh, square hole, um, round peg. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what I usually tell people from a lead designer's standpoint for something like this is I'm the person that learns how to fit a square peg into a round hole. You know, I, I take something that shouldn't work on this console and make it work. Um, <laughs> organizing these graphics pages, you learn after a while that it's, it's an art unto itself. Um, 
you really have to, it involves a lot of high level thinking and like really planning out how you want things to go programmatically with the game before a dev even touches it. Is that, um, that's the Cyclops at the bottom of the... Yeah, yeah. So, so we got to do something interesting with a little Medusa. There's two, two different kinds of sprites you can use on the NES. You can use 8x8 and 8x16. Um, if you use 8x16 sprites on the NES, you can actually, I said before, you can have a page of sprites and a page of background. Um, you can actually put uh, sprites in the background page with 8x16 sprites. And so that's um, a common enemy that shows up basically in every, almost every single level of the game. So we just have him loaded up in the uh, background page at all times. And we're able to just sort of grab him whenever we need him. Otherwise, we were faced with the, the prospect of not being able to have um, enough characters, essentially. Yeah. So this allowed us, like you said, that, that enemy is the basic cannon fodder enemy. Then, shows up in almost every level. Let me so. see here. Let me see if I can remember how these are laid out. I think that's, uh, you have to pick up stars throughout the level. Mm. Like, these couple on the bottom here are the stars. Um, you can, like, mirror sprites. Um, so if you have, like, a sprite that's symmetrical horizontally, you can just draw half of it and then mirror it. And that will save you some space, too. So, like, these two tiles in specific are, like, the left side of the star. And so we'd render those, mirror it, render the other side. So by doing things this way, we enable to have all the common elements on the same page in the data, and then we could use the other page for all the unique hazards and enemies, and then the, the player character as well. So all of this sounds like a lot, and it oh, is. I think we got it. What's yes. up, man? Oh yeah, no, that was, that, that's it to a T right there. Yeah. Super Mario Brothers itself is um, very masterfully put together because that uses a much less advanced mapper than we use. So they actually only have two, two pages of graphics in that game. All the graphics in that game are made up of 128 tiles. And uh, so things like the bushes and clouds needed to happen because they needed to be able to reuse things as much as possible to save space because they just, there was just so little space that they could use. It's a very creative way. It gets back to, again, like, okay, if, if all the characters have the same legs, you know, that saves us so much space, and now we can have a bunch of different attacks, projectiles, torsos, et cetera. Um, so, again, it sounds like a lot, and it is, so how do you get around it? And the answer is, you know, teamwork. There's a lot of, you know, kind of one-man teams out there nowadays in the indie scene, and there's also, there's also one-man teams in... in the retro space as well. We found that if you have a group of people that can kind of play each other's strengths and fill in each other's skill gaps, it, g it goes a lot better. You know, I don't know a quarter of what Andy knows about the technical side of things, you know, but I have a lot of like writing experience, so. He learns quick though. <laughs> <laughs> I have to. <laughs> yeah. So it's just one of those things where, you know, together we can do more than we can apart. So if any of you are involved in some kind of game development, either professionally or as a hobby, um, I would encourage you to, you know, get used to or at least get some experience with working with other people, you know, someone that's, you know, doesn't do what you do. Um, it's good to sometimes work with other artists, or if you're an artist, work with another artist. That way you can kind of ping pong each other or challenge each other and help each other out. But it's also good to work with other types of professionals just to kind of get that experience because, um, like I said, you can do so much more with a team than you can alone. Oh, yeah, and even, like, coming to events like this, like, Prime Magfest, like all of that, going to these kind of events and going and meeting people, like being sort of outgoing and meeting people that do this as well is always a great idea. Um, make friends, you know? You never know who's gonna ha be able to do what you need them to do. I always look at games like Cave Story and it blows my mind that one guy did that. Um, I can't even imagine doing this by myself. Um, it, it would be a nightmare. And then with the retro limitations, it's even more important to have not only a team, but a team that works well together and communicates well together. Because if you're making art and you're making this, all this art and it looks great, and then you know, it goes to the, to the developer and they say, I can't use any of this, you know, it's too many colors, then you have to start over from scratch. So it's important to kind of be organized, and that's why like, there's a little bit of leadership that's necessary. It's good to have you know, someone that's kind of managing the project that's either familiar with everything or is able to you know, connect the right people to each other and keep things flowing. Yeah, I always have someone who's like knowledgeable on the technical side of things. That's usually pretty helpful too. Oh, this is another fun one I get to do. So despite all of the limitations of the system, there are some pretty cool things you can do that you know, 
make some pretty impressive tricks, even for the NES. Oh yeah, so that, that's gonna be me. Um, so the NES can do some really neat stuff, especially if you're using more advanced mappers like we do. Um, it can do things like raster effects, uh, parallax scrolling, and bank swapping. Um, the first two especially um, are interesting because with like the MMC1 and MMC3 mappers, um, it can ha have a register that counts what scan lines are being rendered on the screen. And from there, you can do things. So like with raster effects and parallax scrolling, you can tell it what scan line you want to want it to start like reading at and change the speed of the scroll on that scan line. So I have a couple of cool examples over here. So the title screen for the Adventures of Bayou Billy is a great raster effect. And what it's doing is that it's looking at each scan line on the screen and changing the direction and speed that the, uh, the screen's scrolling at to make that wavy effect. Um, over here is a beautiful game. It's called Swordmaster. It came out on the NES back in the day, and they do all this really cool, like, multi-level parallax scrolling in it, and it's all done the same way this raster effect is. So it's like reading, like, up to this scan line, it scrolls at a certain speed. Nope, I lost the screen. Lost power, I think. Did I? Oh, no. So, so all right, I'll just start talking about it then. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, the way it was doing that is it was reading what scan line we were on and telling it what speed to scroll it at. And then hopefully you got to see the mountains behind it were also scrolling behind them. The NES only has one background layer. Um, they were cheating that effect by using bank swapping. Um, they, what they did is they made that sort of tileable mountain pattern and then made graphics banks of it just moving over one pixel at a time until it looped all the way back around on itself. And then it would read where the player was and like where the screen was scrolling and use that to animate that background tile by like basically flipping through the banks like a flip book. And it would make that sort of layered mountain background that wouldn't normally be possible. And these things are cool when you can fit them in the game in a way that makes sense. Like the Bayou Billy title screen is awesome. You know, it looks cool. It's not that hard to do. It doesn't take up a whole lot of space. So sure. Um, to give a counter example, you can do like 3D graphics on the Sega Genesis, but it takes up almost all your chips. So, you know, it's cool from a technical standpoint. And if you're trying to see like, you know, how far can we push the system? You know, like how much juice can we squeeze out of it? You know, push it beyond its limits. I'm all for that. But at the same time, we're a game company. We want to put out new experiences and not just, you know, kind of uh, tech demos. So it always comes down to, like, is this worth it? Is the, the wow factor worth it? Or is it going to take too much space? We're not going to have enough game left. So it's usually, you know, a trade-off of, like, what can we do to kind of, like, impress people, but at the same time still have a fun game? Because at the end of the day, if you have, you know, 3D graphics but then no game, what's the point? So next is talking about testing. Certainly. So one of the pitfalls of retro dev is the testing process. You know, once we make a game and put it out there and sell it to people, there's no way we can put out a patch or, you know, a bug fix. There's no way we can just, oh, click a button, download, and it's all, it's all good. There's none of that. So the testing process is, you know, pretty rigorous. And the problem for us is that, you know, we try to put out things on a semi-regular basis, and we're telling people, oh, it'll be ready, you know, March, then it comes out in May because there's bugs we find, we have to go back and fix them. We want to make sure it's completely polished before we send it out. So it is a big hassle, and it is a big pain in the butt, but it's something we have to do. And um, there's a couple layers to it. So for us, when we're doing dev, we usually go for sort of this like deep vertical slice is what we call it, where we try to get like a large snapshot of the game and get all of that working properly and then add content later. So for Little Medusa, for example, you know, we added Medusa, all the levels, all the different traps and stuff, and then went back and added in the enemies and the bosses and everything. We got the core mechanics working right and then just added content on top of it. Another path is to kind of do the opposite where it's to, you know, get your player character working fine and now get the enemy systems working fine. Now do all the enemies, now come back and do all the backgrounds, now come back and do all the bosses, now come back and make it all fit together. Um, there are strengths and weaknesses to both. We've tried it both ways. I think from a testing standpoint, the first way makes the most sense. You know, you can kind of get all the systems working well together and then add content on top of it. 
But again, it comes down to the dev and then how much space you have and, and what you're trying to pull off. And um, also, um, like with us, with what we do, um, we need to be able to test it on hardware. And there's definitely inconsistencies between like an EverDrive and an actual NES cartridge. And so that's not really on the table when we're talking about making a commercial product. And so having a deep vertical slice tends to be better for when we have to like physically make a copy of the game in order to test it out on a real NES um, instead of having to like go back and forth a whole bunch of times because then you're going to have to burn chips a whole bunch of times. You're going to have to like keep making copies of the games way more than you normally would if you just had a, a nice deep vertical slice of the game to test with. Yeah, testing on hardware, um, again, physical distribution, you want to make sure everything is perfect before you send it out. So, do you have a question? Okay. So, and the cost of goods is, is kind of like one of the biggest setbacks here, you know. Um, making all these games not only costs money in parts, but also costs money, you know, in time to put them together to solder chips and, you know, put labels on carts and everything. So, screw carts together. Uh, what a fitting slide. Yeah, this is embarrassing. <laughs> Where's my mouse at? Another thing with the, uh, the testing process is to have multiple testers. Um, I think at the beginning, it's helpful to have kind of one person leading the testing charge, working with the dev to be like, okay, this should work like this. This should do it this way. Um, if you have too many cooks in the kitchen, we've found that it, it's hard to make any progress because everyone has different ideas and everyone's kind of pushing for different things and then ego can kind of get it in the way. Um, that's where it's helpful again to have a leader, to have one person that's kind of you know, has this vision of the game and says, okay, this is how it should work together. And then, you know, maybe bring in someone else to, that's an expert in art, for example, and say, hey, is there anything we can do to make this look better that's not going to break the game? And then later on, once it's into a more finished state, then you bring in more people to, like, look for bugs and also offer suggestions. And I think on the art note, that was um, something that we went through with Little Medusa, where um, we were getting pretty close to wrapping development on it. And uh, I don't know if anyone saw the uh, James and Mike from Cinemasker did a, did a video where they played little, an early version of Little Medusa. And when we were watching it, I was sitting there thinking, like, those cutscenes look amazing. They could look way better, though. And so we went back in, and I started adding. They were all done with backgrounds. And um, I went and started adding, like, sprite layering to it so we could add more colors to them. They could be a little bit more animated. Um, that's just stuff you sort of come across when you're testing where you're like, you see places where you know you can push the console a little bit harder than you thought you could before. That's that's another back or that's another art trick that you just mentioned. So the cutscenes are these these huge characters that were they made of sprite tiles, um, their NES couldn't handle it. Yeah, it would just uh, if they were made out of sprite tiles, the NES would crash. So <laughs> pretty hard. Instead, we render them essentially as background tiles. I'm, I'm sure if you played retro games, you've seen a, a huge boss, but it's just on a black screen as far as the background. That's how they do that. The, the boss is rendered as background tiles. Yeah, like 90% of the boss will be the background, and then there'll be like a 10%, like his eyes or his face or something will be a sprite tile, mm -hmm. made out of sprite tiles, and that's like kind of their weak point. Right, whatever's moving or if there's any animated parts, yeah. typically the sprites. So that's what we did with the cutscenes. We added some kind of like, when you're fighting the Earth Titan, you know, he's taking over the um, all the uh, the Earth realm. There's like boulders floating yeah, up yeah, and down. Yeah, yeah, so his cutscene. and His like, mouth will move. Yeah, his whole face is rendered as a sprite, and like the, the boulders around him are all sprites, but the rest of them is just background. And it's great. It's way more entertaining, you know, than, like you said, you saw something like, oh, we can definitely make that better, which I would have been completely unaware of. So it's good to have, again, that team and multiple people testing. All right, manufacturing. So we, we do, oh, you have a question? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Coffee crisis. Coffee crisis had a couple. We fixed them, though. Um, so our, our first big, like, commercial Sega game was Coffee Crisis, and the PC version's out now. And Coffee Crisis was started out as a philanthropic project we did with a coffee shop in Pittsburgh. And it was definitely a huge learning experience for us, you know, because we were just going to, like, oh, let's put it out, let's make it, and then that'll be it. And it would be a little fundraiser and, like, marketing piece. But then, you know basically finished the game and realized like we're capable of so much more. So we basically started from the ground up and redid all the yeah. art, added um, new systems, you know. And I think, I think because it was a learning experience, we were fortunate enough to have done it kind of the right way where we used the Genesis version to 
raise money for the PC version through Kickstarter. And um, the Genesis version was one of the tier rewards for it. So we thought we had caught a lot of stuff in that game, but then some of our backers came back like, hey, this is broken in this game. And so we, we went back and like you said, we, we basically overhauled the game, given people's feedback, and then did a program where people were able to like, our Kickstarter backers were able to exchange the game for the new version. So they could like send us the old copy back and we'd send them a new one. And so, yeah, that, that was definitely a case where we thought we'd caught everything, but we definitely didn't. <laughs> we always try to think of the community and our fans and treating them well, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, and they're great, so. So that's why, again, Little Medusa was supposed to come out January, and it came out in May because we did so much testing and polishing and just making sure that everything fit and there were no bugs. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, so manufacturing. Um, so like I said, this is kind of a grainy picture, but over on the right, this is um, one of the boards that would have originally been in an NES game. Um, these, I can't tell which game it is. But, uh, but yeah, this is, this is like a board from 25, 30 years ago. Um, over here, we have uh, one of our boards. Um, it's brand new parts, uh, completely new PCBs. Um, pretty nice catch-all for all MMC3 games, too. Um, I believe this is a copy of Almost Hero. Yeah, because there's no RAM on it. Um, so yeah, we use uh, new boards and then we actually go through the process of, um, we split the program up into just the raw graphics data and then all the programming data and they go on separate chips. So this is like the programming data over here, graphics data on this side. Um, because the NES has like a very split up way it handles the CPU and GPU. Um, so they have to be on separate chips. Um, there's a top slot up here for if a game like Little Medusa would has like SRAM so it can save your game. Um, the SRAM chip would go up here and like the battery would go over here. And then we go through the process of, after we split it, we, we burn them onto the chips and then hand solder every copy of the game. Um, there are things like Infinite NES Lives that I think are pretty decent. They're like, those are like flash boards where you just sort of plug the board into a uh, piece of equipment and it flashes the game to it. But I feel like doing it this way is a little bit, makes a little bit sturdier of a product. Um, I think these will last the test of time a lot longer than a programmable board um, because like everything's just hard soldered to it as opposed to like sometimes surface mount stuff can be a little weak, especially when it's mass produced. So that's sort of why we've taken that route with it. Yeah. So how long has that battery lasted for you can maintain it? About 30 years. <laughs> uh, that would probably be about 25, 30. Um, but yeah, I mean, I still have a copy of uh, the original Legend of Zelda from when I was a kid and the battery's still kicking. So, so uh, we talked a lot about MMC3. You've heard us say that a couple of times. If you're unfamiliar, that's just a board type. It's a mapper type. And it allows us to have how many? 40K? Uh, oh. no. So um, the MMC3 mapper, the um, advantages of it too are... You can have up to 512 kilobytes of program data. A lot more than 40. Yeah, a lot more than 40. Um, mapper, like the next most advanced mapper only allows 256. Um, with the graphics data, you can break up things into smaller banks. You can break up the, like, the raw graphics into like smaller banks and swap them a lot easier. It's a lot better at doing those like per scanline raster effects. Um, so there's a lot of things on like the technology side of the mapper that make using MMC3 like pretty ideal for making games today. Um, I wish we could use the more advanced ones. Yeah, MMC3. We're working on it. They're just <laughs> unavailable. Yeah. So we use yeah. MMC3 because again, it, it's powerful and offers a lot and it a allows us to offer a game we think that we can be proud of and that people would enjoy. Um, we want, we just don't want to make games to make games. We want to make games that like do justice to the system, do justice to, you know, our childhood and like the eight year old versions of us like, oh man, if I could make a Nintendo game, it would have this, that, and this. And the MMC3 really allows us to like put all that stuff into the game. There's other versions of boards, you know, there's like an Enron board, which has, you know, much, much less. That was, uh, that's what Super Mario Brothers uses is Enron. So it lets, uh, I think it's 64 kilobytes of uh, program data. So. Obviously, you can make something that's, you know, a legendary title if you can make Mario Brothers on it. But, um, it, again, it comes down to what kind of experience you want to offer. And 
is your core game like so good that you can just use that and iterate on all your mechanics and then you know split it up over all the levels so and i would also argue that if someone made something like an experience like super the original super mario brothers today i don't think it would be received as well right there we do despite making games on retro hardware there's still expectations, even from people that grew up with this, to be like, oh, well, show us more. What else can you yeah, do? We have this over here. Conventions so. have changed in the past 30 years. So even, even if you're making retro games, like people still have some expectations of like modern conventions being used. Um, oh, one more piece on it is uh, this, there's a little tiny chip right here. And this is actually for the security lockout on the console. Um, back in the day, uh, third-party companies that weren't licensed by Nintendo had a way to circumvent it by shorting out the console security. Nowadays, we have uh, new chips that we can use that actually will talk to the security chip and work properly. That actually is the question I most wanted to ask. Yeah. Oh, um, there's no there's no real uh, hardware patents on anything anymore. Um, it would have cost them way too much to keep those going than it would have been worth, you know. So um, we're also licensed Nintendo devs. We went through that process again because yeah, that's what I was wondering. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Nintendo's pretty aware of what we're doing. We're, and some companies play nice with things. Yeah, right. But they they if they didn't want to play nice about it, there's not too. I mean they. The, the main leg they'd have to stand on is they have way more money than us. That's about <laughs> it. Yeah. 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 They have a lot of resources to make things unpleasant. Exactly. Yeah. So, but, um, and then for us too, you know, we're doing this as a company, you know, it's what we do. It's not, it's, it's more than a hobby for us. So we wanted to make sure we do it right. And, you know, if we're all doing this full time and, you know, putting our stakes in, we didn't want to mess that up over something like that. But yeah. No, it's a, Yeah. Now? Yeah. Um, but uh, a, a great example is we we always look at making stuff in like the handheld space, but we can't touch the Game Boy Advance yet. Um, the uh, hardware patents aren't up on it, so it's we're, we're not allowed to go near it. This little jazzy interlude between slides. Excellent. So the other the flip side of all the kind of like the you know convergently stuff about the um, physical manufacturing is doing these cool things with it you can do. You know, there's something to be said about downloading a game and playing it on your couch. There's also something to be said about the experience of going to the store with your mom as a kid, getting a, a, a new box, taking the shrink rack off on the way home, diving into the manual, and then finally, like, you know, slamming the cartridge in. So we try to recreate that not only through the boxes and manuals, but also with these limited edition shells we do. So as you can see, we have a smattering up here. Um, like this Creepy Brawlers one is handcrafted acrylic there's only 100 released and it's it's for our movie monster boxing game so it has this halloween feel to it the, the log jammers one that's a functional nes cartridge that's made of wood um the coffee crisis one with its acrylic stand and then i think probably like the coolest one is we're doing a project with devolver right now from fort parker's crunch out and it's about a you know cfo of a um um indie publisher that's kind of pushing all his indie dev minions to pump out these games, you know. And we have a Super Nintendo cartridge that when you plug it in, it has an LED screen that lights up. Yeah, so the, this text actually only turns on when you have, like only shows up when you have the cartridge in your SNES and like have it powered on. So basically you take it out of that circular base and you plug it into a Super Nintendo top loader and it'll play the game. And so it'll look beautiful while it does it. Again, you know, the boxes, the manuals, that's all stuff that, that kind of goes back into this, this idea of the, the retro game. Like, those are things that are lost throughout time. And nowadays, it, of course, it costs companies less to just release di um, digitally. But they're still, like, I think it's the same kind of thing with, uh, like, music geeks and vinyl. Like, oh, it sounds better on vinyl. Well, and I think there's just something to be said about how, and this is kind of, at least me personally, why I don't like that manuals are going away, is that there's something to be said about how manuals can add to the user experience of a game. Um, like our, our manuals have like tons of like lore and like descriptions of the characters and stuff. And back when we were kids, you know, we might not read the manual as soon as we get the game, but like a week or two down the road, we're just sitting around doing nothing. We would pop it open and read it and like read all about what was going on in the game, you know? It also allows us to get rid of tutorials. 
Um, that too. <laughs> modern games are notorious for kind of holding your hand and like, oh, this is how you move. Now press this button and jump. And the S controller, you don't really need it. You know, it only has a D-pad and you know two buttons. So sometimes people do get confused, and we do want to communicate to them. And it comes down to, do we put that in the manual, or do we have an in-game tutorial? Problem with an in-game tutorial is it takes space. That could be another level. That could be another boss. It could be you know another feature, or whatever. So we opt to put it in the manual most of the time. So just to kind of bookend our presentation, um, why retro? You know, we talked a lot about how to do it and, and why we do it. I think beyond nostalgia, beyond our passion for the platforms that we grew up with, I think there's this kind of um, desire to get physical in this digital world we live in. You know, we're all in front of screens so often. We're all connected only through, you know, the internet and whatnot. There's something about a retro game sitting down on the couch next to your buddy in your mom's basement and playing it that's just this elemental experience that you know you don't get anymore. I think it's the same reason why escape rooms are kind of popular now, is that people want to be social and engage with other people, and they want to do it in a fashion that's not like, you know, mediated through technology. So same shared physical space, it, it just can't be beaten. And on top of that, I mean, we all wanted to make video games when we were kids, and when we were kids, that meant making games for like the Sega Genesis, so we never, I think everyone that works for Mega Hat, I feel like I can speak for them, never really lost that passion from when they were kids for making games for those platforms. Um, even before I worked for Mega Cat, I used to draw artwork um, within technical restrictions just because it was something I always had a strong gravity towards. Um, I don't own either. <laughs> I, I, I collect, so I, most of the games that were on those I own. Um, if I didn't own them, I would probably have them day one, you know. I, I'm more excited about the next version of the NES Classic that'll have Mega Cat games on it. That's right. <laughs> That's not, it's not happening officially yet, but we're working on it. But if you get some back channels, I might be able to hook you up. Yeah, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I think, I think uh, another thing as far as um, now me, you know, Playing these games younger and playing them now, why retro games? I have a family, and I don't have time to devote to a game that has 100 hours of content. Like, oh, that sounds great if you have a lot of free time. I don't. You know, I have three kids, so it's just not there. So these experiences that kind of offer, like, fun, fast, engaging gameplay that you can digest over half an hour or an hour or two hours or whatever, and yeah. then pick it up again, and it's still fun because the core experience is meant to play that way, that's great. That's yeah, I, I think like uh, I, last time I played through the original Legend of Zelda, it took me like two afternoons. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that kind of, it's, it's, but it it's, was like, it's a, perfect. An extremely fulfilling two afternoons, you know? So, so that's it for us. If there's any questions or if you'd like to come up after either way. Hey, go ahead, man. We did not. I'm sorry. We don't, we're not vending. We don't have a booth or anything. So we don't. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're kind of split across two events right now. Yeah. Um, so, so for what we do, it's pretty costly. Our games like retail end up retailing at about 60 bucks, like complete in box because the parts are pretty expensive. Um, those infinite, if you're just looking to make an NES game and have it in a physical format, those infinite NES lives boards are pretty great for that. Um, NES makers coming out, that's going to be great for that. Um, it's good. Those are two things that will like make the cost for it plummet a lot. We also um, own the injection molds to do the cartridges. So because we really wanted to control the quality of the parts that are going out. Again, it gets back to this kind of like the end user and the, the, the community that we're serving. Yeah, but even then, I mean, we, we, we own injection molds for all this stuff, but you can also go to like AliExpress to get shells. Um, oh, that's what I mean is that's why, that's why we do it our way is because yeah. we can make sure that it's a high quality yeah, yeah, the way, yeah, as the, opposed we, to. We have like a little bit more quality control over it, but if you're not necessarily as worried about that, then, you know, you can go to AliExpress and get the shells pretty cheap. I think I have. Yes, uh, thank you. Ooh, look at you. You got it one step ahead of me there. That's this, that's this final slide. Um, so we have, I, I put a couple of pretty decent resources on there. We actually at megacatstudios.com have run a blog um, that really takes you through our process 
across all platforms, not just retro, but uh, modern as well. Um, Every time we learn something or, you know, discover a new trick or implement a new trick well, we publish a blog about it to kind of put that information out there. Um, NES Dev has a pretty awesome wiki online um, that has a lot of great information about, like, pretty much anything you can know. It's, like, one of my main references when I'm working on stuff, you so know. When we first got started as a company, we actually, you know, we were pretty active on the NES dev just because it did have so much information from these kind of pros that really set us up for success. And now to give back to that community, that's why we do the blog. And now when engaging with the Super Nintendo, there's not the same community around it of like homebrewers and ROM hackers and whatnot because the architecture of the Super Nintendo is so difficult, it's so hard to develop for. That's why there's not that many like original new Super Nintendo games. So we're kind of pioneers in a 30 year old console. You yeah, know, and we're, we're, we're gonna look to. So anytime we kind of like wrap our heads around something or you know figure something out, again, we put out a blog about it. Cause yeah, now we really wanna, again, support the community, help other people, you know, give them a leg up, you know. Yeah, and another great way. Stand on our shoulders, to, essentially. Another great way we're able to give back to is because we do so much we're so hardware oriented. Um, we tend to find that things about like the compilers and things that are used to make the actual executable don't necessarily always match up with the hardware because we're using it in ways that the people who created these like community tools never really intended it to be used. And so we'll find out there's something weird about like the way it communicates timing to one of the chips, and um, which is. Creepy Brawlers was one where we had to find that out because we did it. It's a very like, punch out style game, and we had to do a lot of, with like parallax scrolling and stuff to make it all work. And so, uh, whenever we find something like that, we'll usually fix it and then, you know, resubmit it to their uh, repo on GitHub and sort of try to make their stuff more accurate for them. So. Any more questions? Well, thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you guys so much. I know it was life changing, so might wanna <laughs> might wanna take a nap, um, reflect on this for a little bit. But yeah, thank we'll, you. We'll be here all day too if you want to come up and talk to us. Yeah, yeah. If you want to come up and talk, um, I I can give you a business card. You can hook up. Do you, do you use stuff for NES or? Yeah. Retro. I've actually done a couple of games. I tend to do games for Udomdari. Okay. Yeah. 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 Pretty fun. Perfect. All right, well, thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Enjoy your mag labs.